Good morning, New Hope Community Church family and friends. We are excited about um, the opportunity we have each and every week to open up the Word of God. There are those that are watching online in the Southwest Florida um, area of the world, as well as across the nation and even uh, uh, around the globe. We will be meeting in person um, at New Hope Community Church, and we find ourselves in a sermon series about when God walked among us. There are other people that are joining in um, unfolding the Word of God um, on a regular basis here. You know, we've had um, uh, our teaching elder, Nigel, Nigel Dice, has uh, opened up the Word of God recently. We've had uh, Pastor Ming Tao, who has um, opened the Word of God for us. Pastor Arnie, who um, is our, with our Presbyterian Church um, on a regular basis, is opening up the Word of God. We have Joe um, from um, Celebration Recovery, who opens up the Word of God. And it is my privilege as the uh, um, the interim transition pastor to actually open the Word of God as well. And we're going to actually, um, uh, because of the nature of this week, um, we know there's lots of excitement about the fact that um, God is still in the, on the move, even in the midst of times that are so tough. Okay, now we're going to be looking at Ezekiel chapter 37, and it's 10 verses, verses 1 through 10. And I, I don't want you to miss, uh, miss what God's Word has to say. Listen to the Word of God. It says, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones, and he led me around them. And there were many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, mortal, can these bones live? I answered, oh, Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy that these bones... And say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus, the Lord, uh, thus says the Lord your God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay your sinews on you, and I will cause your flesh to come upon you, and I will cover you with skin, and I will put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a, a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And as I looked, there were sinews on them, and there was flesh that came upon them, and the skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy that the breath, prophesies mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come, from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. And I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up a vast uh, multitude on their feet. This is the word of the Lord. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, as we think about this passage, where uh, it, it is just beyond our imagination to think uh, that any human could actually cause dry bones or, or, or the dead to, to actually rise. But we know with you this is absolutely possible. We know that there is a time that you walked among us and you continue to be present with us even this day. I just ask that as we hear your word that our hearts would be inclined to actually live the life that you've called us, that you will breathe afresh and anew into us by your Holy Spirit that we might be able to live even during these very dry times, these very trying times. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, thousands of years ago, the nation of Judah and all that was left had once been a proud, you know, a proud Israel of the King David and King Solomon. And it entered its particularly dismal period around the mid-17th century B.C. Judah was never really a power broker among the nations of the Middle East. Um, often she seemed to be more of a pawn that would be used and abused by dominant military powers. When Assyria flexed its muscles, carrying away the 10 northern tribes and what had once been a 12-tribe confederation, Judah seemed that she might be next to be consumed by the Assyrian armies. Thus, Judah lived in constant peril of massive military invasions. Most of, the, of Judah's kings didn't help matters any much. 
Manasseh, Manasseh had a long reign, but it was all marked by brutality and injustice, as well as nations' religious life became marginal, marginal as Manasseh led the people unto practices that were far, did you hear me? Far from God's law, far from the things of God. The best thing to be said about uh, him was that his son Ammon was uh, that his reign was very short. Thus, however, there was a blessed, you know, faith-filled uh, revival under King Josiah. But Josiah later, later military decisions weakened the nation and the kings who followed him. Several of very short durations were their reigns. Uh, where, you know, there were all kinds of um, exercises in, in, in the way that they lived that were, they showed that they were completely inept and they were spiritually confused. Eventually, new national power comes along. It's the Babylonians, and they invade Judah. And at this point, Ezekiel's ministry of prophecy came into play. I have to give you a summary of those years preceding, um, uh, you know, I've given you the summary of those years preceding Ezekiel's time in order to help you, all right, be able to understand, right, what, what was going on with all the confusion and all the apostasy and all the despair that set an emotional, political, and spiritual stage for all of Ezekiel's ministry. As the Babylonians invaded Judah, they carried off many of the brightest and best young men of the nation. In this Babylon, the Babylonians were following quite a sophisticated political formula. They recognized that many of the people in the nations that they conquered were superior scholars or craftsmen, so they strengthened their own arsenal of leadership with those people that they conquered, much as a present-day conqueror might apprehend nation, a nation scientist or computer specialist. And we think about all that's going on in the, uh, across the globe today with the conflict that we see over in Europe and the potential conflicts in Asia um, and the conflicts in the Middle East. This is actually a formula that's been followed for thousands of years, even back as far back as the Babylonians and the Assyrians um, uh, and their interaction with Judah. Ezekiel was one of those taken captive in early Babylon's military actions. As far as we can tell, he spent all of his rather lengthy ministry as a prophet in exile, ministering first to the fellow exiles, but also in the same fashion to the people of Judah who were still in residence back in Judah, the homeland. On the surface, it seems as though um, he wasn't noticeably successful with either group. Even the best prophet, the best political pragmatist, um, or the best crusader is limited by the material for which he works with. Ezekiel's material was not very promising. As I've already kind of, um, you know, indicated, except for Josiah, right? Judah had been, you know, led roughly for centuries by kings who themselves were either an apostate or spiritually neutral. I cannot judge the quality of the appointed spiritual leaders at the time, the priests and the Levites, but I do, do know this as a matter of fact. It would have been very difficult in Israel or Judah for the, uh, for the general level of spirituality to rise much higher than that of the king. Because Israel's history and the relationship between the nation's political and religious leaders the king was the kind of an inevitable spiritual arbitrator or judge. So if the kings are spiritually inept, if the kings aren't following after the one true God, you can imagine that even the Levites and the priests and all the rest of them would not rise to the occasion. This fact is simple. Ezekiel had a disheartening 
ex exasperating assignment. And for the people who were there that were still in residence back in Judah, back in the Holy Land, he was a distant voice. He was, you know, discounted easily by the people. When Ezekiel counseled them not to migrate to Egypt, we can point, uh, posit, we can actually posit or think that they reasoned to themselves that he had no business advising them from a dispatched detached location. As his fellow exiles in Babylon were concerned, though, their energies were too invested in simply staying alive and in calculating how to maintain a successful conciliary relationship with, their, with those that were their captives. But Ezekiel had a kind of spiritual toughness about him that kept him going. Spiritually, it could be argued that he came from a good stock of people. Since his father was a priest of Judah, of course, this doesn't, you know, finally prove anything. But all in all, you got to understand that he's coming from, a per he was a person whose parents were good and godly people and didn't follow, you know, the way that others had followed. But they still trusted in God. And indeed, as all of you know, Professional religious leaders don't necessarily live up to their title or their calling. Still, the odds are reasonably good for Ezekiel. Had good parents who followed after God. He was raised that way, so he had a, a fighting chance. It's fascinating by the insights into Ezekiel's personality as they're revealed in his writings. As we actually open and as we see here in the book of Ezekiel, uh, you, know, you know, the different instances. In one instance, it seems that the closest thing um, that we could say that he was was like a meticulous historian. Thirteen times in the course of his book, he gives specific dates in which he received a particular vision. Right? So it wasn't like just he's just writing a story. He's actually like a historian that's recounting this. No other Hebrew pro prophet, by the, way, by the way, is so exact in such details. Another time, Ezekiel's writing, or like that of an architect or engineering, as he lays out almost in painful detail the descriptions of the temple that he envisions in replacing the one that the Babylonians have destroyed. And still yet another time, Ezekiel sounds like a novelist as he describes the nation's spiritual apostasy. And, and it, it was so much, actually, it, it was it, so ridiculous that there was actually sexual language to be found in the Bible as he was given the description of their, their waywardness. And then, of course, there are the writings for which he is best known, even among those who don't know what the Bible um, is or particularly well. He describes an, ex an exotic vision. Perhaps only such an irregular personality was sufficient, right? One that was actually, as you can see, an historian, you know, uh, as, as, as an architect or engineer, as a novelist, as a prophet, with such a personality that actually could bring all this together into the circumstances in which he was called to minister. So those people he preached, as I've already said, they were dull of having spiritual hearing. So he spoke in shocking directness and calculated these to get their attention. Even if he could, he could not with certainty win their souls, he would startle them into listening. So at least he would, they would know that he was a prophet of the Lord and the prophet of the Lord had spoken to them. Mind you, they might not always have realized it at the time, but Ezekiel was dramatic. Sometimes almost uh, with the irrational challenges that must have evidently been, in, that would try to circumvent power. They might argue and might not agree with him, but neither could they actually comfortably ignore him with the way that he writes to them here. Why should Ezekiel be so upset over the state of the nation? Why should it bother him so much that his fellow citizens are, you know, would actually, would abscond and they would go to Egypt rather than remain in the parts 
um, you know, uh, in the part that they were? Why the larger body, body of Babylonians that were their captors? Why is he so upset? Many of the Babylon, uh, the many in Babylon, were choosing to accommodate to the foreign culture in which they were living. Isn't it better to live like a dog than a lion? And if the dominant power is such has such strength that there is no hope of gaining freedom, why not forget about the homeland and make your life just part of the, the foreign culture? That's what the people were reasoning to themselves. Indeed, what's so bad about uh, you know, appreciating the culture for which we are? You know, it, it, is it so unjust that we would try to actually just make eke out a living, celebrate and thinking? They were the challenges that were very pragmatic questions that people probably were asking themselves, and that history was shaped by people with such alternatives to actually the things that really mattered. Take, take such a matter as freedom. It is worth the sacrifice uh, that some have been willing to do anything to achieve it. And justice, that's another one. Is it such a high-sounding word, but what is the price to actually look for justice, sometimes it's unreasonably high. And then, is it better to lower one's expectations and live with all things just the way that they are? The Bible, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, insists that humans are made of better stuff, that there's something more to our lives, that can never, there can never be peace unless God's perfect will is realized in our world. We agree that there are, that many souls have known little to nothing of the scriptures, yet have inevitably had something of the same, of a, a divine vision that Ezekiel had. Perhaps the secret is hidden, spoken in John's gospel, um, that Jesus Christ is the true light which enlightens everyone, as it says in John 1, 9. If indeed, as I believe, and I think you might as well, that the light of Christ is at work in every human being, we can expect that even quite secular, quite pagan people and their souls long for a better world, longing for it to come beyond themselves, that the life has to be more than that, and it, more than the, the basic elements of their personalities. Nevertheless, those whose vision for such a world is deep, that they will struggle to bring it to pass, will always be in the minority. Did you hear me? Those that actually have that deeper vision, that deeper that, that call to life than more than just getting by, right? They're always going to be the minority. The rest of the world pushes such feelings aside, Right as they're struggling just to, to, to survive. Only a few, very few, take on the pain to work through such an end. Ezekiel was such a person, and he paid for it dearly. Perhaps it is the kind of final indignity that Ezekiel was buried in Babylon, an exile even in his death. When the patriarch Joseph died, he asked that his bones would eventually be carried back to the land of his fathers, the land of promise. And centuries later, when his children, the children of Israel, fled Egypt, they carried Joseph's bones back. We read this in Genesis chapter 50 and Exodus 13. Ezekiel enjoyed no such exit, but in the midst of all the rejection and all the persecution of his long life in exile, Ezekiel had his moments. Ezekiel begins the story without any embellishment. Indeed, it is the only one of Ezekiel's vision that does not have a date for us. Did you hear me? It's the only one that's not dated. Instead, he begins simply saying, the hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley it was full of bones. That's how he starts off this vision in Exodus 37. It was, yes, a place of the dead. The one and no one chose was chosen by the bereaved as a burial place for those that they loved. 
their beloved. At best, what could be seen is a battlefield of corpses that have been, that have been left uh, uh, bleached by the sun. It could as well have been a place where bodies were thrown frantically during a plague. Whatever was the case, there was no time for burial. This was a place of death. This was a place without the benefit of a structured grief, without rituals of remembrance. No stones were there as memorials. With no expression of love, of memory, it was just, what was it? A valley full of bones. Ezekiel reports that God led all, led all around the bones. There were many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. That's the description he gives in verse 2. Five minutes in the valley of bones is enough already, right? And the prophet hadn't hoped for an escort a tour, but God has a point to make in this trip that he takes Ezekiel. It's important that Ezekiel knows just how bad things are. And the prophet confesses that he's gotten to the point, these bones, he now realizes, were very dry. What is, what is to say these things about were as bad as they're going to get? Then God prods Ezekiel with a question, mortal, can these bones live? Ezekiel, and Ezekiel, God bless him, is, is ready with an answer. Oh, God, you know. The prophet, right, is savvy enough to, you know, put it back into God's court. God isn't finished yet, though. It seems like he's almost being playful. Prophecy, prophesy to these bones and say to them, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. That's what it says in verse 4. I preached, you know, in various places, all from street corners and Skid Row to cathedral-like churches to, you know, all over the, the planet, and I got news for you, all right? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if I've ever preached to a congregation unmistakably, uh, you know, mocking, mockingly, they're dead. God seems to be inviting Ezekiel to put his call to the test is he really an anointed prophet? Or are there congregations beyond the reach of his talents? Well, I don't hold you in any, I won't hold you any, any more suspense any longer. Ezekiel decided to do what God says. Ridiculous as it might seem to do, he preached to these bones. There was a noise a rattling, and the bones came together bone to bone, verse 7. By the time the prophet got to the point, three point, you know, kind of like point three in his sermon, the bones stood to their feet in a vast multitude, verse 10. Now God told Ezekiel to point the point of this remarkable exercise, that the bones represent his people, Israel, <clears throat> uh, it, it, our, your hope is not lost. You're not completely cut out. That's what it says in verse, uh, verse 11. But God sees things differently. I am going to open your graves. I will bring you up from the graves. Oh, my people, I will bring you back. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. I am. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves. That's what it says in chapter 37, verses 12 and 13. See, this is God's message to the people who saw such a hopeless situation. And they couldn't picture anything else than a nation that was utterly dead. Indeed, reduced to a boneyard. Uh, bones that were very dry and worse, that right, a good share of the people would either would never realize the situation to be anything different than that, and it simply the people didn't care. They'd learned to accommodate themselves um, to their hopelessness, to their hopeless state. But there is one man who cared 
a son of a priest, a man who couldn't shake himself free from God's vision of Israel, whose only reward was, uh, was such a love for such a vision was the misery of in, uh, unceasing despair that he would have for giving this vision out. So God took that lonely soul on a particular journey, and it was at first the journey that seemed only to underline Ezekiel's worst analysis, as if God was saying, you think things are bad, you have no idea really how bad they are. Then, the most hopeless moment, at his most hopeless moment, God challenged Ezekiel to dare to prophesy, to declare faith in the face of death. And he did, and a miracle of life began to assert itself until at last, the valley of dry bones became a playground for life. See, this message that I'm giving today is for anyone, just like it was back in his day, for anyone living in a hopeless scene, for anyone whose holy misfortune to want to see a situation redeemed but have no hope. It may, run, it may be a rundown life. It may be a rundown neighborhood. It may be a rusty family or a rusty city, an economic in an economy that's gone, the world that apparently is committed to self-destruction, the valley of dry bones has a panorama of, uh, of faces. Uh, God has committed to life to those who believe to dare to bring their death valley to him. I believe that this is the case even for New Hope Community Church, that, you know, it might seem like we've been in a in a valley of dry bones that are completely dead. But God wants to do something new. There is a specific theme of promise that through our Lord's resurrection, that death has lost its sting and victory. I believe that it is an extension of the truth that applies to those that are experienced where death makes it insistent claims. War, and we got war on our planet now. Poverty, prejudice, materialism. Congregations that have lost their way and have not been trusted in God. And such a place, I think, is we're just around the corner that there's an Easter faith that fills our souls that will conquer the conviction that Christ has won. If we partake in a life that it is Jesus Christ, right, in, in, even in the unceasing battle against death that he did, whatever form it takes, and to know that even when we struggle, we are still to prophesy, we are still to pray, we are still to say to, in the valley that it is never so dark that the bones are never so dry that the battle is lost. God's season is always a winning season in that even when we feel like we're in that valley, God is walking with us through that valley it is his spirit that causes and tells us to prophesy, to praise, to declare dry bones, right? And then, and then it's going to just, the breath of God come in. So it is my hope and my prayer during this season that we will not give up, even if we see ourselves in this dry valley, this dry place, but we will stand and we will prophesy. And we will actually do what God calls us to do and say and, and call for the breath of the four winds and come in, that the Holy Spirit would come in. And it is our prayer that the Holy Spirit would be ever present through our congregation and that in turn that we would see even in our community that these dry bones would rise up, walk and live again. That's my prayer for you. God bless you. We'll see you again.